Good afternoon, everybody. Scott Stevens here, where I'm on another perspective where I get a little bit of an opportunity to talk to you about topics outside of um, outside of meteorology, outside of climate, outside of that field of, of profession where you know I was. You can be in news, but you kind of get into pigeonholed in, in sports or weather or in news, and then you've got to hold to the party line. You've got to hold to that which um, you know your, your company that's paying for you. Hey, good to see you guys coming on in there, Risa and Vicky and the others that are there. If you want to say hi, I give you a little shout out. I'm never opposed to that. You have to give StreamYard permission, however, to see your name, and then I can go uh, go a little bit further. What I want to share with you today is an experience that I had uh, just about a week ago. I'd spent a year and a half in Puerto Rico, and that's a very different experience than living stateside. Let me tell you, there are some attractions to it. There are some downsides to it. Living in a colony versus living in a state, living in a place that is part of America, but not really. So that lasted about a year and a half, and then I ended up coming back to Colorado for a couple of reasons, and, and in some ways I'm glad to be back, and, and in others, um, you know, I, I kind of miss the island. I kind of miss being outside of, of of the reach of the states, but then not really. So in the process of becoming repatriated, if you will, I had to turn in the Puerto Rico driver's license and get a Colorado one. And in that process, you're, you're it is a process. You've got to prove your identity, you know, passport mail, uh, old ID, and so forth. So what I found in the process was that uh, I was presented with making a decision. I had to choose a side. And this was not something that I, I, of course, I knew I had to go through this, but it wasn't something that I hadn't done in a while because I hadn't renewed a license or got a new driver's license. So I was cho I had to choose a side by the guy who was going through my paper paperwork. And I'm going to call this, this little episode, the illusion of a two sided system. Now, so what I was doing was, was literally, um, let's see if this will page. Yeah, right there. I had to choose a side, a, politi a political side through a voter registration. So I had to get my, my Colorado driver's license renewed or reinstated. I had to, to go through the question, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Which one would you like to choose? And I, I sat there for a moment and, you know, I could not choose one or the other, having come from one party and indeed being a delegate for one, you know, not too distant past. Uh, but I could not in my right mind, you know, identify with that particular party. And then at the same time, the other one I didn't feel had yet earned my vote or earned an allegiance. So well, we'll talk about which one I chose. So what I've learned during this administration is that you can hold your views about what's going on very closely and maintain your friendships or you can express them and potentially lose those friendships, even if they are within the family unit. That ostracization absolutely happens if you don't agree. And so I was looking through some Thomas Jefferson quotes, and he stated, I never considered a difference of opinion in politics and religion or philosophy as a cause for withdrawing from a friend. And can you imagine being able to maintain and hold that point of view through all that our founding fathers endured as they separated from, from the mother England and where you know they were essentially either French or they were Spanish, which were a little bit farther south uh, through, through Mexico and, uh, and, and then into South and into Latin America, or the French up north through Quebec and through Eastern Canada. But the English were definitely had, had a foothold in what would become the United States. And so through all of that, all of that, uh, deciding to go through a revolution, to deal with your own taxation, to deal with your own legal system, to set those processes up that you could maintain friendships because of your common desire to see a good for mankind come out of it. And so that was kind of a, a significant quote for, for Jefferson, because in reviewing where we have been uh, in this country, where we have this divide, where we have this you know, literally this anger between the two sides and coming from the media side of things, it almost as if they are the agitators. Yes, Robin, it is so true. And it is through choice. And Christina, uh, I choose, uh, I choose neither, neither or either. And I do not root for the donkeys or elephants. And this is a veiled far 
collapse of the two party system. And I, I, I couldn't agree with that more. It's almost like a, it's, it's become a religion and probably a false religion at that because it probably, well, I know it doesn't determine where you would go in the afterlife, which party you choose to decide whether you're red or blue. And even red or blue is kind of a misnomer because in 1980, they literally changed colors where the, the Republicans were blue up until 1980 and the Democrats were red. And somehow this whole, whole shifting has happened uh, about the political parties or identifications and something as basic as color. And we'll kind of get to all that. But this divide, this tear in society has manifested in such a way that even last night in Seattle, we were dealing with these, these protesters in continuation of this to where I believe it was the ninth precinct in Seattle had to literally be a abandoned to the protesters. So we've got this, this angst that has been fomented in the society, and it continues to literally build day after day, protest after protest. It goes, and are these ideological distance uh, differences, or are they literally legit differences? And that's what I kind of really want to try to understand. So is it a function of optics where you know, from one view, a lion is standard cub, or the other, it is uh, the consumption of the young. So our perception of where we stand on, on these points of view is going to greatly determine the outcome of an event and more likely how we participate or become invested in the ongoing event. Same with the riots and the, and, and the, the parade and the funeral and all of these things. There is a whole nother point of view as to why this is happening, how this is happening, who's supporting these these revolts and these revolutions. And it takes some effort to stand back and see that. We'll get to come to that in a moment. All right, we're going to go back to how the parties have changed. Back to 1956, the Republican Party platform, assistance to low-income communities to protect Social Security, provide asylum to refugees. Remember, this was just 10 years after World War II. So the idea of refugees was economic, but also war-torn, and a war that the whole world had been engulfed in. So refugees then versus refugees now had a slightly different connotation. And there were a lot of refugees from France, from, from England, from Germany, and then even, even from Japan that were brought over because also we had so many soldiers over in those foreign lands that found their spouse, that found their wives, found their husbands, and then came home. So improving unemployment benefits to cover more people, strengthening labor laws so workers can join unions and equal pay regardless of sex. And I don't believe that one has actually even been accomplished. So in this commentary, Eisenhower was the last great Republican president. He also taxed the wealthiest at a rate of 91%, unless they expanded their businesses or invested in infrastructure bonds and use it or lose it, because there was no money hoarding back then, and that's why they were so successful in the 50s. So all of the wealth, because at this point in time, with a war-torn Europe, a war-torn Asia, America was untouched and had to become the machinery, the, the manufacturing base of the planet at that point in time. And that really allowed the middle class to, to just blossom and flourish. And we can see that in, 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 the, in the housing boom and, and the redistribution of wealth. And even then it wasn't redistribution because it was stuck up in the 1%. It was because we had a tax rate and a tax structure, which encouraged that kind of reinvestment in the workers. So what I want to do is policy back in 216. So we'll go from 1956 to the last election. So we had a different platform, and, and you'll see how they both evolved. And I don't know, maybe I need to go full screen. Do I need to go full screen? Yeah, Eisenhower wasn't allowed to enter Area 51. Boy, that is a whole nother discussion. And I'm going to bet that this is Ryan, if he's brave enough to go there. And that's another show because I'm with you. Because I think if, if things would have changed and evolved a little bit differently in the 50s, that we would have a very, very different world today. So the Democratic, uh, yeah, we had reinvestment, Vicky, and we either reinvested because the, how should we say it, the tax rate was so oppressive 
that it was best to have that money invested in something that would either further the employment of your neighborhood or your, of your company. And so we had it investing back on in. But the, the Democratic Party tax form in the 2016 Democratic National Platform was adopted on July 25, it included generalized goals that you might expect from the Democrats, such as closing tax loopholes, loopholes that benefited wealthy investors and supporting small businesses by providing tax relief and simplifying the tax code. We actually got that under the Trump administration. They wanted to help fund Social Security by taxing certain individuals with annual earnings above $250,000. I can recall a time when I was anxious to get to like, say, 65, 60, yeah, mid $60,000 range to be free of that 7% tax because it was an immediate raise if you get earned to that point. On the Republican side, they wanted to make the Internal Revenue Code so simple and easy to understand that the IRS becomes obsolete and abolished. Who wouldn't find that attractive? Back to the Democratic side, creating a surtax on multimillionaires and restoring fair taxation on multimillion dollar states to ensure that the wealthy investors pay their fair share of federal taxes. That kind of reverts back to the 1956 period where we had that high, exceedingly high tax rate. Back to the Republican side, removing all marriage penalties from the tax code. Makes common sense to me. Uh, expanding low income in, in income tax credit program for low wage earners who are not raising children. So largely you're single filers. And I can see that because as what was I was a single guy, it seemed absurd that I was paying the highest tax rate when I was also the smallest burden on the system. So that made sense. On the Republican side, replacing the American Care Act or the Affordable Care, excuse me, with an approach to improving health care that's based on competition, patient choice, and timely access to treatment. Timely access to treatment obviously is going to reduce expenses. So you want to be able to get to, uh, you know, your, your care provider versus having to wait till it becomes an emergency. And then emergency patients obviously are paid for by, you know, the authority, by the government. So you really want to hit these issues long, long before they become very, very expensive. If you can mitigate a problem with a $100 solution versus waiting till it's a $15,000 solution. Expanding the child credit by making more of it refundable and or indexing to inflation and reducing the tax penalties and simplifying the reporting requirements for Americans living abroad. And then on the Republican side, re reducing the corporate tax rate to be on par with at or below that of other industrialized nations. That just makes sense. All right. Let's uh, move on quickly. Um, you know, so, you know, we're, we're, it, it's crazy because we get so stuck in the evening news that we think they're giving us, you know, the true history of everything. And that is not the case. That is not the case, Marlene. So to the Democrats implementing a tax on financial transactions to curb excessive speculation, and high frequency trading. I entirely agree with that. They should be like a, a quarter percent tax on any trade placed, whether executed or not. And that trade must stand for, say, 72 hours. And in doing that, you don't have these companies, these high frequency traders spoofing the market where they come in and make it look like there's all this liquidity. And then as soon as the price reaches up to that point, it evaporates. And so there's no buyers where it looks like they're buyers. So they can, with illusion and with these high frequency tradings, make it appear like there's a big bid under, say, oil or under wheat or under gold. And when people go down to sell into it, it evaporates and then you have the price free falling. So we're ending up with flash crashes. And if you put a very small tax because the volume of these trades is so utterly immense, it's mind blowing how big these events are. But if you force them to pay a little tax, and then make that trade stick for 72 hours, you could change how our, our, our financial systems would operate. All right, over to the Republican side. Adopting a balanced budget amendment that would impose a government spending cap and require a supermajority approval for any tax increases, except in the case of war or legitimate emergencies. And we've been in a state of war since 9-11. So could that ever be clawed back? Could we ever get out of that declared state of emergency that would take us out of this financial responsibility to our kids, to our grandkids? All right. Uh, tying any new value added tax or national sales tax to the simultaneous repeal of the 16th Amendment, which authorizes the federal income tax. This is fascinating to me. 
And this is a road that I, if I was in a position, would absolutely want to explore. So, um, you know, we, we saw how Trump and the tax uh, tax rate did change. He did get the, this push through. We compressed um, all of the various federal tax brackets back down into, I think it was five or six minimum brackets. And he also would like to abolish the alternative minimum tax, which means that if you get deductions, if you have these kind of reductions to your to your your gross income tax, you take out your, off your personal deductions that you're still, there's this, this value that you have to pay. You can't get any lower than this alternative minimum tax. Um, Clinton would like to impose new restrictions on tax increases on U.S. companies with foreign operations. Her plan includes a, t- a risk-free risk-free on large banks and financial institutions, as well as curbing tax subsidies for oil and gas companies. That just makes sense. When you've got the Democrats so uh, aggressively going after oil and tax right now, or the oil and gas companies, like they want to put plain old shut them down. They've got uh, Warren on the record. Uh, uh, Bernie and, and Biden also ended up on the record for simply shutting down fracking. Now, environmentally, environmentally, that makes sense. Those are not sane, sustainable practices for water, for earthquake mitigation, for so many reasons that we probably will not fully understand for generations to come. And that is kind of scary. Over in, uh, over on the Republican side, uh, let's go down to estate tax. Uh, Trump would like to eliminate the federal estate tax. And then we have had uh, the Affordable Care Act and those related tax increases have been clawed back. And if you didn't get insurance, you were straight up fined like fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars $1,700, depending on your family size. That's if you can't afford health care and then all of a sudden are hit with this big bill, that's offensive. It's just offensive. So all of these issues are dealing with with money and how do we solve the problem? How do we solve this? So we have an object. We have two places to set this object, this cylinder. And if you're looking at it on the side, obviously you're going to need to stick it in a square. But if you're looking at it lengthwise, you've got a circular opening to try to fit this thing in. So what it really comes down to is effort and willingness to explore are necessary to see and then comprehend the whole picture. And if we cannot comprehend the whole picture, if we cannot see the the entirety, the picture, the solutions we're projecting, we're seeing a shape on a wall. If we don't see the object that we're trying to manipulate or understand, we'll never get it in the right opening. Facebook user... And the IRS is not the police. Yeah, I, 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 you won't get any con, any pushback from me on that particular one. But the IRS has their own uh, statute police. By statute, they've got a police force. And that I don't know whether it is actually constitutional. There were some things that have come up during these latest uh, uh, Floyd riots about the constitutionality of a lot of metropolitan police forces that sheriffs are allowed, but these individual agency funded and supported police forces, there might be some room to, to, to claw them back, to bring them back. And then how we replace that has been a whole other discussion that I guarantee you we will have over the next couple of, a uh, couple of weeks and months. All right. Uh, next one. And this is kind of interesting, and it's going to play into this willingness to explore and be necessary to see and comprehend the whole picture. But we also go through different phases in our lives. We absolutely begin to, to see different things as we move through phases in life. Any man, said Winston Churchill, who is under 30 and is not a liberal, has no heart. And any man who is over 30 and is not a conservative has no brains. I had not seen this quote until a couple of days ago when I was uh, you know, looking for, for content. And it's an interesting point of view. And um, this is probably the biggest contention that's going on in this country. And whatever side ends up with the majority, be it democratic or perceived, then will ultimately attempt to impose their views on the others through force, through uh, shame, through mob action, or through censorship. And we are seeing all of the above occurring on in the country right now. And for me, this is this is going to be a problem. You were just talking about this quote last night. Yeah, it's it's completely new. And and I 
honestly am in a very different position than I was just a year and certainly more than, you know, back in 16, as we were heading up to these elections where I was not fan, a fan of either one of the candidates, they both honestly made me uncomfortable for each of their own reasons. Um, and integrity probably being at the top of the list for both of them. And if you cannot vote and hope or trust that that person you're voting for has even an aspect of integrity, then it, it, it's really tough to say to choose a side. And as I started this, I was unwilling to choose a side in that last election. So it became easy to either sit it out or look beyond the first two candidates. So let's take this just a little bit further. One of the other reasons people hate politics is that the truth is rarely a politician's objective. Elections and power are. And right now, power comes from money. And we have uh, in this last election, I believe it was Andrew Yang, talking about democracy dollars, where people could donate or get $100 of these democracy dollars. And then without having to engage the corporations for, um, for um, dialing for dollars for, you know, because as soon as you take money from somebody, there is absolutely a quid pro quo involved. It's expected. So to believe that you can't go out, raise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for your party, for your own campaign. And in the case of the Democrats, which I didn't know till, till this year, that they had to donate money to those Democratic caucuses or the congressional caucuses to then buy their positions on committees. Those who donated or raised the most money were granted positions on these committees, whether it's finance, whether it's transportation, whether it's intelligence, that all cost these people money. So what you see are those representatives, congressmen, and senators who come from the districts, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the money districts are able to raise three, four, five hundred thousand dollars or more to then buy their way onto their committees. And that to me, I found uh, honestly offensive that it's not by merit, it's not by raffling or randomness. Um, that it is you purchase your way onto these committees and with that comes power. With that comes then the string of lobbyists into your office and each one with a handout either to take something or to give you something. But with that is always a guaranteed instance of quid pro quo. So again, back to Cal Thomas, one of the reasons people hate politics is that the truth is rarely a politician's objective, election and power are. And so where are term limits in this? And this is and has been a solution. Um, you know, once you end up with a two-term li two term limit, and which one, is it two terms for senators? So you're, you're guaranteed 12 years in office. Is it three terms? So you're, you're guaranteed or can stay in office for for uh, for 16 years, or no, it'd be three times 12, that'd be 18, or six times 12, or six times three, 18. And so when we see these, uh, these congressmen, these senators who are from New York, who are from San Francisco, who are from Los Angeles, in office for 25, 35, 40 years, then there's a big relationship that has been developed between them and the Intelligence Committee. Because as Schumer said, Chuck Schumer, there are six ways from Sunday that the Intelligence Community can get to you. So you have got to be a team player if you're going to stay in office. There is no other way around it. You play the team's game and you'll get reelected. There will be weak opponents chosen for you to run against and you'll be reelected. You're raising the money. You're voting the way they want you to. And even if they have blackmail material against you, and if you're a team player, how can they not? Because there are always things that you kind of wish in hindsight, mm, I could have done that a different way. They didn't need my vote on that. I didn't need to treat that person this way. And this doesn't even get into the secret society aspect of things. This is just what is plainly visible. And in the iceberg, what is visible above water? And then there's the whole cesspool that happens down below. So that's kind of a different thing. So politicians talk in general, these Paul Lynn, do you remember that, that comedian? Some of those comedians, 
that little bit of truth said in such a funny but very sharp and exceedingly truthful way. Politicians talk in generalities and lies, and I think they've caused all of our grief. They're so awful, they're really funny. And I hate thinking this because my dad loved politics. Paul Lind. So, um, you know, I didn't get raised in a family wherein politics were were discussed. It it just didn't happen. I remember 10 years old, um, we'd just moved to Idaho from New Mexico and the, the TV was on and uh, the news came on. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, I'm 10. I knew, I didn't know I was going to get into this way, but I, you know, I had a curiosity and I'm, mom, what's the state department? I had no idea. And I don't remember the answer she gave me, but it was probably enough for my, uh, my developing curiosity. But so this is, this is something that I've been curious about for a little while. So next one, I hate all politics, says Ray Bradbury. I don't like either political party. One should not belong to them. One should be an individual standing in the middle. Anyone that belongs to a political party stops thinking. No truer words have been said by, and that was by Ray Ray Bradbury. What a great author. All right. So where are we? An individual should be standing in the middle. Let's look at the middle. The left believe in government control of your finances. Libertarians, hmm, never voted that way, believe in personal freedom and economic freedom, whereas the right believes governments control your morals. The left, the United Nations led U.S. military actions. That's what they believe in. And then libertarians are a non-interventionist foreign policy. Live and let live. They also believe in a robo- the Dem- or Republicans of robust national defense. Nothing wrong with that. A defense is one thing. A Department of War is another. Remember when they changed the name of that from the Department of War to the Department of Defense? Just about the time that we began starting a whole new, new series of wars. The right believe in nation building. Although I think this probably could be brought over here because of the United Nations and other agendas that remain below the tip of the iceberg that we don't necessarily see. All right, the left in imminent domain for private gain. The libertarians, the tolerance of others, personal choice with respect for others' property rights, whereas the right believes in the war on drugs and your right to choose. The left banning guns. Libertarians, civil rights and privacy of your own affairs. And uh, the, the right believes in the right to keep and to bear arms enshrined in the Second Amendment. Could it be any more clear? And the right also believe in the Patriot Act, although that really got passed with the overwhelming majority of both sides. And again, this is another one of those acts that is nearly 20 years old that without blackmail, I wonder how it would have passed or even proper discourse. You know, if a bill ends up in front of the Congress and needs to be passed tomorrow, that's reason enough that it should not be passed. There really should be a time limit that if a bill gets introduced, that it sits, it sits out there and it waits for a month, three months, because there is absolutely nothing in that bill that needed to be passed overnight. That was just insane. All right. The left believe in taxpayer funding of secular charities and the libertarians with the separation of church and state and giving generously to those in need, whereas the right believes in taxpayer funding for religious charities. And I don't know that this was always the case. It certainly came about in the uh, in the 80s as we had the, the religious right really begin to gain some prominence. The left believe in the special treatment for select people and uh, also ending corporate wel- welfare. Nothing wrong with that, especially in when you've got industries that are making money hand over fist because of monopolies, oil and gas in particular. And now we have the social media, the tech valley, money hand over fist, and they absolutely have monopolies. You think Facebook began, and then Instagram's an option. Facebook buys Instagram. Then you've got, uh, what else does Facebook own? The, li- the list is long, but they're consolidating power outside of the RICO Act, the racketeering, and they're outside of FCC and, and monopolies. So these are things that right now I think the president is correct in, in approaching. All right. The left believe in the welfare state, which uh, it's a blessing and a curse. 
Uh, also in supporting charitable organizations, uh, whereas the right believes in a strong economy with little need for we- well for welfare and eliminating social security nets. There's a happy medium. There's a happy medium. All right, I'm going to go on down deeper. In 1980, the libertarian policy believed that these departments needed to be abolished. The deal. Department of Energy. And remember, this was just after the oil crisis in the 70s, and the DOE was not 10 years old because it was a Carter creation. So it was a new beast, Environmental Protection Agency. And when you go down this list, every single one of them, and then you consider regulatory capture by corporation, maybe it is best that we maybe just throw them away and start with something new with new people, new regulators, new regulation, so we can begin to build this country and build the economy and in doing so truly repair the environment. Because if if we've got, if Monsanto and glyphosate is as bad as they say it is, then why would it be supported and encouraged and and potentially even in vaccines? So there's things that we've got to look at to to clean up. All right, as we're uh, getting there on time, All right, democracy will cease to exist when you take away from those who are willing to work and give to those who would not. And that doesn't mean you can't have charity. That means you can't see in a political or in a community policing type of situation where there is need, obvious need. And we have these resources where previously or currently our our taxes and our donations and our gift end up in organizations that consume so much of them just through administration, or those funds don't go to the end need. And there is a lot of that that happens around the world. And when you put in politically centered foundations upon which you trust that a rebuilding will happen, and it doesn't happen, then we're, we're, we're just setting them up. We're setting them up for failure. And Haiti is the one that immediately comes to mind. All right. The end of democracy and the defeat of the American revolution will occur when government fails or falls, excuse me, into the hand of lending institution and moneyed corporation, Thomas Jefferson in 1816. Those structures that we're dealing with today that run the government were seen, foreseen because they were still there to hundred plus years ago. So what has really changed? And I think we're going to get into a discussion here in the next couple of days, uh, maybe not next couple of days, but probably within the month on alternative forms of exchange. That's too important. All right, we'll close this with uh, President Kennedy. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. So I think where we are as a country Some will say and defend the current position, the current policies, the way things are, the status quo as being enough. It's good enough. And I, uh, even though I can disagree with some of the more radical, if you want to use that word, uh, word, new, uh, new congressmen that are in office, they speak an element of truth, especially though, those from, uh, from Minnesota. They're AOC and some of those others that I, I don't necessarily agree with a lot, but I love how they're instigators, that they're making people choose a side. They're making them choose to think, to consider other options. And whenever a field is plowed, then you can see what's underneath the dirt, but then also we can plant new seeds. We can take this in a different direction. So my feeling is that we will have both a peaceful and also a violent revolution. Both will happen. What I don't know is the time frame, but what I do know is those seeds have absolutely been planted. All right, this is another perspective, and uh, I love your your quotes, guys. Uh, the question, Robin, let's bring this up over here, so we'll kind of return. But then the question is, what is considered work? Fair question. Meaning, is a hedge fund manager or a bank working? They produce, make, manufacture nothing. Is that working? No, it's like they're a a broker moving an asset between people, even if they just touch it for a fraction of a second. And this is why, for me, it's important to tax those trades, even just a little bit to slow it down. Then they'll reconsider. They'll, They'll either be important because that trade still goes through, 
or they'll reconsider um, the high frequency trading. I think that there's a solution, but just a little bit of a tax, you take out a quarter of a percent, just a little bit, and it'll slow things down. I also think that, nah, that's another show. That's another show. The IRS is a whole other show on flat taxes and so forth and so on. All right, guys, glad to see you in here. Hey, there's looks like a little bit of crowd going on in there. And um, glad to have you here. We do this on Mondays and Wednesdays at one o'clock mountain. And if you happen to catch it on replay and literally make it 35 minutes in, then hit us with a hashtag replay to let you know you're here. You can still post questions and we'll, we'll get them answered. And if there's any show topics that you're interested in that we can do a deep dive in, then I am all ears or all eyes, both work. All right, everybody take care. And uh, we'll see you tonight as we do a little weather show and see, uh, if a Lake Superior had its first brush with a depressed tropical storm, Cristobal, that would be. All right, everybody, take care. Have a great day.